Hello and welcome back to another lecture for pre-calculus. Today we're going to be going through a section on the inverse trigonometric functions and some other graphs. I'm only going to go through sine, cosine, and tangent. I will not be going through secant, cosecant, and cotangent. Um, there's really not much in the text on that and we really won't be using them much. Um, the same process that we'll do for sine, cosine, and tangent, you'll go through that same process with, with the other three as well. So. Um, we're just going to cut down on the time and work through those uh, three primary trig functions as opposed to their reciprocal ones. Um, just to forecast again today, uh, today is the 12th, I'm recording this on Monday, and <clears throat> um, we have office tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow class on Wednesday, office hours Thursday as well, a quiz on sections 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3 this Friday. Homework for these sections 5.4 and 5.5, five, five. Um, let's do next Monday the 19th. And again, next week on Thursday and Friday, the 22nd and 23rd of April, we have our test scheduled for chapters 3 through 5. So keep an eye out for an email with some, uh, some study materials. Uh, keep an eye out for some, some practice test solutions. And uh, I'll, I'll send those to you through Blackboard and email. Um, or if you just watch the YouTube channel, they'll be there as well. Okay, so what are we doing today? We are, again, going through section 5.5, .5, and this is on the inverse trig functions. And before I get into um, the material for the day, I want to really quickly just talk about just the idea of an inverse function again. So a function takes some input, so I'll call my input x, and it maps it to some output, which I will call y. So this is, this is a function. Uh, if, if each input goes to only one output. So this is not a function if I send this input x to multiple things. Okay, so this is not a function if I send it to like three things. Okay, so a function takes one input and maps it to exactly one output. Um, it might be the case that there are multiple inputs getting sent to the same thing. This is totally fine for functions to do. But in this case, what do we know about the function? Well, we notice we know that it does not have a well-defined inverse. So remember that an inverse goes the other way. It uses these outputs as their input, and it attempts to go backwards. We denote this with a little negative one sign superscripted. So it takes this output, and it's like, hey, that is my input now. So the inverse takes that as the input. And it attempts to determine which one of these to send it to. Now in the case where your function sends exactly one input to a unique output, so it, it's only going, each input goes to its own unique thing. No other inputs go to that same one. This is a really easy inverse, right? So I'll example that here with arrows. If our function was one to one, like this, well, the, the inverse would be super easy. The function takes us to the right. The inverse takes us to the left. Easy. A lot of functions are not that way. And in particular, functions we are looking at are not that way. So let's look at first sine inverse. There's a couple different ways to write sine inverse. The first and most popular way is to say sine inverse of your input. That's the most common way. Another way of writing that 
is this arc sine of x. These two notations are equivalent. They're, they mean the exact same thing. Okay, and let me change this from an x actually. Let me just let me call this w. Okay? So sine, if you remember, sine takes an arc length or an, an angle and it maps it to, what does it map to? It maps it to a number in negative one to one. Specifically, it takes it to the y coordinate of the terminal point for that angle. So if we start here, we pick some arc length t, and we look at this terminal point p. The sine function tells us this y value. And since we're working on the unit circle, the y value has a maximum right up here of 1. It has a minimum right down here of negative 1. Okay, so again the sine takes some angle or arc, t, and it just outputs the y coordinate, which is some number between negative 1 and 1. Okay, so the sine inverse or the arc sine, what does it do? Well, it takes some y coordinate. So I'm going to up here put y, just to, just to illustrate that we're taking the y coordinate. And what does it do? It maps it to the arc that gave that y coordinate. And as I said earlier, this is, this is, not, a tr this is not a simple thing with trig functions because how many angles give you that one y coordinate? There's lots. So if I picked this point here. So this is our, our arc t. We know we should get this arc back. If we if we plugged in this y coordinate, what should we get back? Well we would hope to get this one, right? But it's not that simple because there's lots of other arcs that have the exact same uh, y coordinate with their terminal point. For example, What if I used this angle? So I just go around and keep going all the way around plus another t. So this is t plus 2 pi. That has the same terminal point, doesn't it? In fact, I could take any multiple of n of any multiple n of 2 pi, add that to t, and I get some angle, some arc, that loops around the circle several times, n times to be exact, and ends up right here again. So it obviously has the same y component, which means if I took the inverse of y here, right? if I took the inverse of this y, I might as well get something like this, right? The inverse of that y takes me to the angle which gives, which gives me that point with that y coordinate. Any of these angles work. But to make it even worse, there's more. I'm just going to draw a horizontal line right at the height of that terminal point every point that intersects this horizontal line on the unit circle has the same y coordinate which means this angle I'll just call it um, s that angle also would be given by the inverse of sine 
right? Because it has the same y component. So there's another angle. But it's worse because what else could I do? I could keep winding around the circle until I get back there. So I just keep going. And so I, I take 2 pi plus s. That's another angle that gives me the same y coordinate. But it's worse than that. I could, in fact, take 2 pi times any multiple n, add it to s. That just means I wind around the circle n times, and then add s to that. And I arrive at this same terminal point right there, which means sine inverse of y gives me that angle as well. So this is really, really kind of a kind of an interesting thing. What kind of function is sine? Is it 1 to 1? Certainly not. Clearly, I, we've shown that here. Is it 2 to 1? Because there's two angles here that give me the same y coordinate. Certainly not. How many angles do I have listed down here? I have an infinite number of angles listed down here any multiple of 2 pi, add it to s. Or take any multiple of 2 pi and add it to t. And here I wrote n like a natural number. These are the positives, but I could have chosen any integer. So it's even, even worse than that. I can pick negatives here, right? So there, there's, a, there's a huge set of numbers, a huge set of angles for the sine inverse of one given y component. So how do we choose? Right, because clearly this is this is not an invertible function. So as we've defined it, this is not an invertible function. It's because there's too many possible outputs for the inverse function. And if we have a function, a supposed function that takes an input and sends it to more than one outputs, that's not a real function. So by writing this down here, we are admitting that sine inverse is not a function because it takes one y value and sends it to an infinite list of possibilities. So sine inverse, without some modifications, is not an invertible function. It's invertible, yes. It is not an, an invertible function. Sine is not. Okay? Or should I say, sine is a function. Its inverse is not a function. That's the right thing to say. Okay? So what do we do? How do we adjust this? Well, there's usually, there's, there's a common thing that people do and uh, it has nothing to do with changing the fact that sine gives you the y coordinate. We're not going to be changing sine to, uh, in that sort of way. Instead, what we're going to, going to do is restrict. We're going to restrict this angle t. Okay. So it turns out that for lots of functions, you can make it so that their inverses are functions if you just restrict the original function's domain. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take our sine function, which I'll graph in, let's go light blue here. We'll start with sine. Sine goes up, comes down, goes back up, keeps going like this forever and for always. Over here, comes down, goes up, comes back down, and keeps going forever and for always in that direction. If we just apply the horizontal line test here, we'll obviously see it does not have an inverse function because there's lots of intersection points here. Here we see four of them, but really there's an infinite number because this, this wave keeps going forever and ever. So how can we change this function to make sure there's only one possible intersection? Well, we have to restrict the domain. We have to cut off parts of this sine function. 
So what the typical setting is, is we're going to take this point and this point, and we're going to take everything in between it. Okay, so this specifically is from the angle of negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Notice that sine does take values from negative 1 to 1. It takes all of them. So if you pick, if you go through these angles in here, you'll notice that this entire range for sine is covered. For every value in this range, there is an angle in this interval, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, that gives you that output, that gives you that value in the range. Okay, so if we erase everything else, right, we think about the sine function now as being restricted to just this little s. We do have an inverse function. Okay, now it's not sort of in a sense, it's not totally the inverse of sine because we've removed parts of sine but it is representative of sine in the sense that for any one of these values here between negative one and one, we can get an angle that gives us that value. Okay, that's kind of a good thing. As opposed to getting an infinite list of angles, now we can get one angle back from the inverse. And that is the goal. So what we're going to do here is just now make this definition really formal. Okay, so the inverse sine function, as I've written it over here, the inverse sine function is the function sine inverse with domain. I'm just going to write the, word, the letter D here. Domain D equal to negative 1 to 1. Remember, the inverse function has inputs, that's what the domain is, which are the outputs of the original function. Um, and range, negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. What this, all this says is that the allowed inputs to the sine inverse function are any numbers between negative one and one. And the possible outputs for sine inverse are any angles or any arcs between negative pi over two and pi over two. Okay, so you pick some number between negative one and one and it tells you which angle would have given you that for the sine function. Okay. When you define it this way, okay, so when you define it this way by restricting the domain of sine and thus restricting the domain of sine inverse, you have yourself a function. So now we've got a function. So let's do a few easy examples here. What is the sine first, the sine of pi over 6? That's something that you should have memorized by now sine of pi over 6. It's 1 half. Okay. What is the sine inverse of 1 half? Well, if the sine of pi over 6 is 1 half, remember the inverse just takes 1 half and brings it back to the angle. So this is pi over 6. Okay, slightly harder example here. What is sine of, let me see if I can get this here. Uh, I want four pi over six. So 
sine of pi, 4 pi over 6, so 2 pi over 3. There we go. Why did I pick that one? Because if we think about pi here and split it up into six parts, here's the angle we just looked at, pi over 6. Here's 2 pi over 6. Here's 3 pi over 6. Here's 4 pi over 6. Here's 5 pi over 6. I, I didn't want to pick something that's the same as this. So I wanted to pick something a little different. And I didn't want to pick this one because that's still in this range. For this example, I wanted to pick something outside of this range just to see what happens. OK, I want to illustrate why we have this, this strange restriction on sine inverse. So I picked this angle, OK, 2 pi over 3. What is the sine of 2 pi over 3? This is something you should have memorized. It is the same as the sine of this one. That angle is pi over 3. So this is root 3 over 2. What is sine inverse of root 3 over 2? Well, is it this? No, it's not. <laughs> not according to our definition. We restricted sine inverse to only give angles between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So we can't give the angle 2 pi over 3 because that's, that's here. That's outside of this sector of the circle. So what does sine inverse give? for 2 pi over 3. Well, it gives the angle which has the same reference angle as 2 pi over 3. That's pi over 3. OK, it's this one. OK, so this is like, this is a really good illustration. See, both of these. I'm going to redraw this splitting into thirds or sixths here. Both these points down here have the exact same y coordinate. So when you take the sine of this angle and this angle, they both give you root 3 over 2. Okay, so they both get mapped this way. They both get taken to root 3 over 2. So when you want to go backwards with sine inverse, this goes to this one. So the inverse goes there. It does not go over here because we restricted our function to eliminate the multiple options thing that we had going on earlier where the input for the inverse function went to an infinite list of possible angles. We're cutting that down to just give a possible range between this angle pi over 2 and this angle negative pi over 2. Okay? All right. <clears throat> I'm going to stop belaboring that point over and over again. My son is not enjoying it. <laughs> okay, so uh, one more quick example. Just to get something, just to get a point across. What is sine inverse? of pi. So this might be a little confusing because that looks like an angle, right? Pi. If we think about the unit circle, you know, that this is the angle here, pi. And so we might think to ourselves, oh, sine is the y coordinate, so this is, this is clearly zero because pi is at a height of zero, right? But it's not, because this is the inverse. This is the inverse function. Okay? This is the inverse. So this is not equal to zero. The y coordinate at the angle, the y coordinate at the terminal point for the angle, pi. Okay? 
sine inverse takes you from some value between zero, sorry, between negative one and one, and it brings you to the angle which gave you that value. So here's my here's the follow-up question. Is pi <clears throat> in this interval? What is pi? It's like three ish. <laughs> so it's it's kind of like over here. It's a little bit bigger than one, right? So this does not exist. There's no angle which will give you a sine value bigger than one. So this does not exist because pi is not in this interval negative one to one. Okay, all right, so that's it for sine. So we're gonna move on to cosine inverse. Um, and it's gonna be the exact same story here. Okay, so we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at first cosines graph We'll do a few examples of it, and we'll we'll uh, move on to tangent after that. So cosine, as I've said before, looks exactly like sine, but just shifted over at pi over two, and um, so we're going to look at cosine inverse. So there's again two notations for this. I'm going to write an x here because remember cosine tells us the x coordinate for a given terminal point for some angle. There's an equivalent uh, way of saying this and it's arc cosine of x. These two say the same thing. Cosine inverse of x is the same as arc cosine of x. The more commonly used one is cosine inverse of x. So, if you'll notice, this again fails the horizontal line test. If I picked a specific height, well, I don't know, like 0.5, and asked you what angles give you that x coordinate, you would find an infinite list of angles. This one does, this one does, this one does, this one does, right? There's an infinite list. So just like sine, we need to restrict the domain of cosine by only graphing part of it, essentially, is what we're, what we're saying. So what section of this cosine graph, is there a section that is one to one? Is there a section that um, hits every range value of cosine? So that's every value between one and negative one. Is there a section of this graph that goes all the way from top to bottom, and uh, you know it doesn't sort of it doesn't fail the horizontal line test? Is there a portion? Yeah, there's lots of portions, just like with sine. But the one that's most commonly chosen is this one, starting here and going down to here. Everything in between. Okay. So that is, that section corresponds to the angle set zero to pi. Okay. Now we could have easily chosen like negative pi to zero. Now this part is also one to one and it goes from negative one up to one. Uh, we could have chosen from here down to here, which would have been negative two pi to negative pi you can restrict it in lots of different ways. But the commonly done, the commonly chosen uh, set is from zero to pi. So cosine inverse is that function uh, with domain, just like sine, negative one to one. You can only plug in numbers between negative one and one and range different than sine. Sine went from negative pi over two to 
pi over 2, remember? If we did that with cosine, we wouldn't have a 1 to 1 function. Because we could pick any height in here and we're, we're definitely guaranteed two different angles that give us that height. So we can't choose negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 like we did with sine. The range of cosine inverse is now 0 to pi. Okay. Um, you'll notice in both these cases we, we only chose half a period for cosine and sine. Right, if we choose a full period, then we get that overlapping bit like we had before. Okay, now a quick couple of set of examples. Um, what is the cosine inverse of one half? So what angle gives you an x coordinate of one half and is in zero to pi? I know you could give me lots of different angles, but there's one in particular that you should have memorized. So you think about the unit circle, think about which one of these points here has the x coordinate equal to 1 half, so it looks kind of like this, that's the angle. It's pretty close to pi over 2, it's exactly 2 thirds of the way there, it's pi over 3. Okay, but there's lots of others you could have chosen, right? Cosine inverse of pi over 3, you, you could have chosen negative pi over 3. That's the same thing, just going in the opposite direction. It, it also has an x coordinate equal to 1 half. Okay, but this is like right there. It's not in this section here. So we will not answer with that. That's outside the range of cosine inverse. Cosine inverse only gives you angles between 0 and pi. Okay? Alrighty. Um, so that's, that's cosine inverse. Uh, let me illustrate something here <clears throat> with another example. Certain problems in your text will do this sort of thing. What is the cosine inverse of cosine of an angle? Oh, I don't know. Let's pick one like pi over 2. What is this sort of a thing? Well, you can always evaluate these things by hand from the inside out. And sometimes that is kind of necessary. Um, I'll show you two examples here where one it's not and where the other one it is. Okay, so first, when you see this cosine inverse of cosine of pi over 2, we're just going to think about what this is. This is some number between negative 1 and 1, right? It's some number right in here. And I noticed that this angle, pi over 2, is actually a number in here. So I noticed two things. What does cosine inverse do? Well, cosine inverse tells us the angle in here between 0 and pi, which gives us this number. So it's not too hard to see in this problem that we're going to get pi over 2. OK, just to, to piece that out again. And now with the actual values, we're going to do this from the inside out. What is cosine of pi over 2? That's right here. Cosine is 0. What angle gives us an x coordinate of 0 and is in 0 to pi? Well, the only angle that does that in that interval is pi over 2. Okay? All right, so here's another one, very similar. Cosine inverse of cosine of, <clears throat> we will go with negative pi over 2. 
Now you'd like to say that this cosine inverse and this cosine just sort of cancel each other out and you're left with the angle by itself. That's how inverse functions right, normally work. That's not the case here. Okay, And the reason this is not the case is because this is not in the range for cosine inverse. Cosine inverse, as we've defined it, will never give you a negative angle. It only gives you angles between 0 and pi. Okay. So for this one, what is the correct answer? We can work it out by hand. And it's going to it's going to look pretty similar to what we just did. So this is the same as cosine inverse of whatever cosine of negative pi over 2 evaluates to. Negative pi over 2 is right here. So that point is at a height of 0, which means this here is 0. And what is the cosine inverse of 0? That is, what angle between 0 and pi gives us a value of 0? That's obviously, again, pi over 2. Okay, so this is this is very illustrative of what's sort of happening with this inverse function. If you give it any angle, sorry, any value between negative one and one, right, it's going to give you values in here. And if you chain it together with a cosine, where you start with an angle sort of outside of that, okay, outside that zero to pi interval, if you're chaining it together like this. What cosine inverse is going to do is it's going to sort of fold the outer parts in to this 0 to pi interval. So here we saw this negative pi over 2 sort of get folded in here by this chaining together. Okay. So th this is really sort of an interesting thing. I think we've got this and we've got this oops, being the same despite the fact that the, that the initial arguments are actually different. Okay? All right. So, um, I, would, I would say that you should do more examples of this. Um, and you will as you do your homework. Okay, so tangent. This is our last one. Tangent looks really funky. If you'll remember, tangent has these asymptotes, which I usually draw in pink. And uh, if I were drawing it by hand, these would be dotted lines or no lines at all. Okay, so these lines are drawn at pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, negative pi over 2, negative 3 pi over 2, etc., etc. Remember, they were they were always just drawn. Um, the the lines were drawn whenever um, cosine was zero. So uh, that's because tangent sine over cosine. And in between here, what does the graph look like? It looks like this. Kind of looks like an x cubed. And it just repeats itself over and over and over again. So our goal in defining these inverse functions, remember, was to find an interval of angles, so a section of this domain, where the graph is sort of whole. It's sort of complete. It hits every possible range value. And so I think an obvious choice here is just to pick one of these guys. And the one that's sort of in the middle is this one. So let's pick that one. So this is a nice graph of tangent. A representative piece of tangent. And we're going to just forget everything else. 
Okay, we're going to erase this part. We're going to erase this part. Okay. And we're going to use this as our representative piece of tangent, um, just like we did with sine and cosine. So this gives us an idea of how we'll define tangent inverse. So tangent inverse. I'm going to put r here. Because remember what tangent gives you is a ratio. So this tangent inverse takes a ratio in. The ratio is what? It can be any value, right? You can create an infinite ratio if you take the cosine to be 0 or close to 0. So tangent inverse of a ratio has domain of all real numbers. Oops. And what's its range? Well, it, it takes any number, any real number, and it gives you only an angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. If we had kept multiple multiple pieces of tangent, we would have had multiple outputs, right? So if I had given this angle here, this angle here, r, it would have given me this angle. And there was another branch over here, so it would have also given me this angle here. So we only kept one branch so that we definitely had a function here. So there's only one angle being given. And that shows you, essentially here, that shows you what, uh, why we choose what we did for tangent. And um, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. We can do examples. Um, but they're, they're going to be just like what we did. Um, and they just take, you know, the common examples are the ones that we've, we've done before. So like tangent of, let's go tangent inverse of like root 3. Okay, so I'll, first I'll say that root 3 is equal to root 3 over 2. Uh, you can't see this. I'll move it down in a second. Divided by 1 half. So sort of hint scratch work over here for you. Root 3 is the same as root 3 over 2 divided by 1 half. Okay, the reason I say that is because this is going to be a sine value and this is going to be a cosine value. Cosine of what angle is 1 half? That's pi over 3. And it just so happens that the sine of pi over 3 is also root 3 over 2. So since sine of pi over 3 divided by cosine of pi over 3 is tangent of pi over 3, tangent of pi over 3 gives us root 3, which means the tangent inverse of root 3 needs to give us pi over 3, which is just less than pi over 2, right there. Okay, so th there's a quick example of how you can find tangent inverses. You're just, you're just really when you're given a tangent inverse of something, you try and think about the sines and cosines of angles. That's like the strategy to find tangent inverses by hand is when you're given some input to a tangent inverse, ask yourself which values of sine can give me, which values of sine and cosine can give me as a ratio that given value. And then the angles used for your sines and cosines that's the value for the tangent inverse. Okay, So again, just to illustrate that from back to front, we started with root 3. Well, I, I thought about my sines and cosine values, and I knew that these were commonly used ones. And I know that as a fraction, they're the same as that. And then I thought, hmm, this is the sine of pi over 3, and this is the cosine of pi over 3, which means this is tangent of pi over 3, which means the tangent inverse of root 3 is pi over 3. Okay, 
that's, that's I think the effective way to do this the the easiest way to do this is with these common examples have things memorized if you don't have them memorized you're out of luck you can't use a calculator right so you're out of luck um, and if you're not given a, a a common one a simple one um, double check make sure that it is not an angle or is not a value that has a reference number that is a common angle that you've memorized and in the case where that fails uh, you're gonna have to give things an exact form right so let's say this is some let's say I didn't have this memorized and it was not a common thing so what would you put in as your answer this that is the exact form okay um, it certainly beats like for example the book says example six it says find tangent inverse of 20 now to me I'm like what is the point seriously what is the point it says find each value tangent inverse of 20 see what are you gonna do that's not a common angle uh, it's not uh, not something that you can think about sines and cosines with uh, it's not a multiple of pi that's for sure not a whole multiple of pi because if it if it were it'd have a never-ending list of decimals after it so it's not some like nice multiple of pi no way so what is this <laughs> exactly it's this exactly As an estimate, it's about 1.52084, but it keeps on going. So approximately, it's this. And how did I find that? A calculator told me that. How did the calculator find that? It used a Taylor approximation, I'm sure. It's not something you'll even learn to like calculus two, how to do that, okay? So like, it doesn't make any sense for your book to do things like this at this point. So we'll be sticking usually with common angles and common reference angles. And if you don't have something common and you're still asked to give something in exact form, oh, there it is. Just box that. You're done. Okay. And that's it. That's it for section 5.5 um, for the notes. Uh, again, this homework is due Monday next week on the 19th. And again, next week, Thursday and Friday, I'll have the next chapter test open for you. And there's there's really not too much left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sections of study and seven, uh, eight sections of um, homework. Uh, one, two quizzes left, three quizzes left, I think. Three quizzes, a test, and eight homeworks. We are coming down to it. So I hope uh, I hope you're doing well. I hope that this movie helped. Uh, and if there's still questions in your mind, just shoot me an email, okay? I look forward to hearing from you soon.